Are some people born with genetic traits that help them become more successful? Are certain people destined to be successful? It's commonly thought that in order to be successful, you have to be stronger, faster, or with certain innate abilities and skills. But why could two people with similar intelligence, background, and opportunities experience varying results? According to Matthew Said, it turns out it's not only about quantity, but it's also quality of time that pulls out the best performers. In today's book, we will discover the science behind skill. It's time now for Bounce, the science of success. Welcome back. You're listening to Motivation Minute. If you have a tall stack of books in your desk that you wish you've been reading, well, you've come to the right place because we discover the timeless truths in all those books you've been wanting to read so that you don't have to. And today's book is Bounce, The Science of Success. That's right. And another uh, tagline or title he had in the book is The Myth of Talent and the Power of Practice. And that's what this book is all about. I think we all start out with this mindset of certain people are naturally better than other people at certain things, which there's some truth in that, but we all have this idea of some people are just better because they're better, I guess, and some people aren't. And we really use that as an excuse, I believe, and as a a, a victim mentality in a a lot of times. Yes. I Pretty much when I put the book down, I realized this book is a giant proof of that book so good they can't ignore you that we did several episodes back about how skill is greater than passion every time. And yeah, it so drives home that point that just having natural talent doesn't determine if you're successful. It's determined by the skill and the purposeful practice you put in. Yeah. And then what, what actually creates that skill is the question. Is it, is it that some people are more, you know, genetically better or more intelligent. I mean, there's some definitely some people are, a li- are, are more intelligent. So that there is truth in that some people are different personalities are better at different things. But it actually said the smartest people are rarely the most successful. If you And it said if you think you're the smartest or you're smarter than average, then you should be careful because smart people generally do not become more successful because, you know, we're kind of taught in the general school system where the general idea is that you have to become good at a lot of different things, a lot of different subjects, just gain more information. Um, You know, the key to success is to be the top of your class in school, the smartest. But it's said that that's not really what, how people become successful because it's, it's only when you've, when you're good at a specific thing at one specific area and you have deep domain expertise right that makes you successful so it's not overall it's not overall knowledge it's just specifically one you can become successful just knowing being really good at one thing yeah and often the biggest differentiator between experts is not like how much information they know but how much information they can extract from that information so you were saying deep subject matter expert Well, I know guys at work, they can look at a certain segment of code and get a lot more out of looking at that than I do as a beginner. That's the key. You have to know what information to extract from what you're given, and that makes all the difference. Yeah. It's similar to the book Outliers that we read about the 10,000 hours. And and this book just goes more in depth into why that that works. But you need 10,000 hours or 10 years of extreme focus in a specific area to become a master at it and then be, to become successful in it. And what all, but, but how do people get that? Why do some people get, so it's not the talent, it's not some innate talent that, be, that successful people have. It's the extreme um, amount of hours that they have into a certain topic. And, but why do they have that? Now some, there is luck involved because basically it, it told this story of the, the guy that actually wrote this book was a top, like the world champion ping pong player in the yeah. UK. One of the top ping pong players in the world. And he, was, and he actually he wrote the book because he was wondering why, he's, why is he successful? And he analyzed different things over his life. Basically, he grew up in this one neighborhood where this, this other top world champion had trained him when he was growing up. And he had literally played ping pong every day for most of his childhood. And there was just, and then the interesting thing is right in this one street where he lived, this one neighborhood produced 
more um, world champion ping pong players than anywhere in the world. Or huh. it produced like like some like eighty percent of all the top players just went from one neighborhood. And he was like, "Why is that? It's not obviously. It's not. They're not. They don't have common genetics or something. All these just right. random people in this neighborhood. They have um, what do they have? Well, they had. They all spent extreme hours. They all. It was like the only thing they did. Um, with each other played ping pong and they had some of the best experts there that lived there as well that taught them and and so it showed that you know what successful people do have is specific and often unique opportunity to clock up lots of practice right and you're thinking i'm thinking about being in the neighborhood with all these exceptional ping pong players you all are making each other better by getting better yes. and none of you want to lapse and so you're always upping the challenge. And that's one of the things this book was talking about, how successful learners, they use learning to transform the hardware in their brain. So like it creates a feedback loop when you're learning. So every time you fail, you iteratively improve. And it kind of talked about London taxi drivers. I'm like, really? London taxi drivers? Well, it turns out They have a greater percent of spatial navigation ability in their brain. That's not a natural thing. It's learned because they go through some very strict training to learn how to navigate London. And that makes them a very unique person from a spatial sense in their brain, but they weren't born that way. Yeah. And it's all because of the practice they had to iteratively grow. Yes. It said that certain areas of the brain actually get bigger with when you practice a specific thing so your brain actually develops more cells and neurotransmitters whatever to make your brain uh, actually physically bigger in that area and you develop that skill and like it said the table tennis players often have lightning fast reaction times and but when scientists ran a bunch of tests for one of the top players uh, Desmond Douglas he seemed to have a slower reaction time than average than an average huh. person. And he's like, how does this go together? Well, apparently he you know, they said he'd been playing for so long, his brain was trained to basically go on auto. Like your subconscious starts to take over and it becomes so much easier. And pattern-based. Pattern-based. So he just basically so much practice and so much just repeating the same thing of ping pong made him extremely talented or like super fast, extreme fast reaction time but his natural reaction time when they tested it was actually not very high. So that's interesting. That is interesting. And I was thinking of an example, like being a software engineer, I get to play with programming languages that are scripting. So what they do is you can do stuff on your computer from the command line and you write out little programs that run very quickly and you see quick instantaneous feedback every time you make a change. And the beauty of it is with a language like Bash on Linux or PowerShell on Windows that I love to use, I really like them because every time I make a command change, I run it and I see if it works. And if it fails, I try again. And I try again Hmm. until I get to the successful way to run that. Versus there's some programs that are hard to test because you can't test them like instantaneously when you make a change. There's like a delay of a few minutes between every run and you're less efficient creating it because you're not able to improve as quickly and fail as quickly. So this book was talking about how the faster that feedback loop is of fail, 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 succeed, fail, 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 succeed. The faster you do that, the faster you grow. But when you slow that down, it's harder. So once you get used to having a feedback loop of overcoming things that are hard, you fail a bunch of times, but then you overcome it and then you do it again and again and again, your brain becomes used to the idea of you're succeeding like doesn't matter what it takes you're just going to do it and it's not and it's not overwhelming right right and it's kind of like there's a mathematical concept of the second derivative so if your life is a curve your life goes up and down right hmm. so then the der- first derivative is the slope which would be how fast your up and down is changing and so if you have a positive first derivative that's a good thing because you're growing if you have a negative first derivative you're failing so The second derivative is the rate of change of success or failure. So it's the slope of the first derivative. So here's the thing that's the kicker. If your second derivative is positive, you're always netting a positive growth. But if it's negative, 
you're going downhill. So imagine your life, you have an upward okay. curve. There's a point where you may be going downhill, but you still have a positive second derivative because it's the slope of the slope. So wow. you're curved up, so that's positive. Yeah. If you're curved down, that's negative because you're declining. You're like already, you may be climbing in your skill, but you're already on the trend towards going down. Really? Well, that's really interesting because that shows how long term is so important, long term practice, because sometimes it feels in the moment like we're getting worse at something, we're not getting better, we get discouraged, or we want to get it. That's why we want everything right now, naturally. Like we just have to do it right now, and we naturally don't like to just do something over and over for 10 years. Yeah, if you look at the long term, like you were saying with the curve, the second derivative, like it's in the long term, you're actually gaining if you stick with it long enough. Yeah, I've got a guy I watch on YouTube who I like who says, keep your second derivative always positive because that means that even (laughs) if you're failing, you're still on the trend towards growth because your curve is always pointing upward eventually. You're you're doing so many things now that that just seem wasteful, but in the long term, they're going to pay off. Uh, there's so many examples of that. Like, yeah, failing, if you're making failures right now, it's costing you a lot, it's stressful, but you're learning from them and overall it's going to build up and make you very, you know, you're so much more skilled in the future. But, you know, I gave the example of Tiger Woods, for example. He started playing golf when he was two years old. You know, how many of us played golf when we were two and then played every single day for the next 20 years <laughs> <Exactly>. or 30 years? <laughs> no wonder he's so good at golf. And same with um, Mozart. He like wrote his first uh, composure, did his first first you know musical composure, whatever, when he was like ten years old or something, and then he'd been practicing. You know, people put him out as this genius, which he probably was, <laughs> but he also started extremely early and put in the ten thousand right. hours. He wouldn't have if he would have never put in those hours. He wouldn't have just put together amazing music randomly. It it was because of the hours, and there's just the examples just go on and on and on. You know, you were talking about how we make excuses because we don't think we have the talent when we're born. Well, I think that's really covering up that we just aren't learning the right way. Hmm. You think about the deep workbook we did about how the most effective way to learn is to have those deep dive sessions where you really are either learning something or getting things done. But if we don't do that, we're not encouraging the growth. And so we just procrastinate. And that's why Mm. we don't want to learn, even though we all have the ability to do it in anything. Wow, that's that is very interesting. It's about it's about having certain things in place that make you want to learn. You know, successful people do have um, generally have some opportunity that lets them have ten thousand hours. I just remember I mentioned it in the book, The Outliers. But there's this family that we know of people who play amazing music as a family. And they, but the reason is, is because they had the opportunity. Their parents gave them one that they basically required their kids, starting at age four, to start playing musical instruments. Right. And so they were able to get all those hours. Obviously, that wasn't their hard work. That was their parents helping them do that. <laughs> so and they it had was the, the opportunity. dedication of actually putting in the yes. hours. Exactly. So it's it's about that. Like, and there's just certain things that that also make us that help people become more successful like the biggest one of the biggest reasons is they had the opportunity to work with a mentor or like some top person that was that trained them um that's almost always some type of and they had that opportunity for whatever reason um and also you know and they were inspired by the person so it's like it's a motivation by association if you if you've confined somebody that um that almost takes you under their wing or somebody you really admire that you feel like you have a similarity with them, if you can feel associated with that person, like if, if he can do it, I can do it or whatever, that is a huge thing, you know, that can motivate people. Like if you just feel like, wow, somebody else who was like me could do this, um, that is a huge motivator and that, that that's what drives a lot of the successful people because somehow they have that in their life. And I like to look at it, I've heard before, like if if somebody else has done this, like you can ask yourself, has anybody in the history of the world ever done this that was similar to me and the answer is probably yes for most yeah, things and then so go it's, talk to it's, them yeah if you can find that person but it's so if somebody else has done it then it's obviously possible because when you start from nothing trying to get to some goal that you haven't defined it looks like it's impossible but yeah. when you see someone who's farther along you're like oh i can get to where they are our family was ice skating once and there was this 
other family there that was tying their ice skates on and my younger brother Riley who came on the podcast once he went skating by uh-huh. and uh and uh one of us said come on Riles let's go and one of the guys from the family said hey did you hear that if Riles can do it you can do it too and um <laughs> That's and, good. and that That's was the example. motivation for them and so the kid got up and went skating because you know Riles could do it yeah so, no I I've had that same and I can remember things like that when I was younger that's a perfect example of, but we have to actually start believing that in, in other things in our life. You know, even if nobody's telling us, oh, uh, if he can do it, you can do it. No, it's right. like you have to start. And the only way to do that is to actually look at this, what this book as the science of success. It said it's not about having certain people are, are naturally better than other people. It's, it's everybody can do it. It's possible. It's simply just putting in more hours. And it's, it's not, you, you know, you have to believe that you're fully responsible and that you can, and then you have to actually grow. Um, you have to have a growth mindset, not a fixed mindset. And once you have that, and you and you believe that it's possible, then you can look at other people for an ins- for inspiration, and say for yourself, if they can do it, I can do it, and it's all up to me. And that's how that's how you're going to become successful. Yeah, that leads right to my number one takeaway: that there's no fast track to success. You know, mm-hmm. you have to put in the effort yourself. And it's it's not easy. It's it's ten thousand hours, and it's the right kind of ten thousand hours, yeah. not just yep. the number. Definitely, yeah. That's my takeaway too. Honestly, it's just it doesn't seem very exciting. The idea that that we all have opportunities, and of course, there and we is have this truth. ticking clock that we have to meet yeah. ten thousand. It's like wow, I'm just like having to knock off the hours, and it takes forever to get there. Yeah, I mean, there's all there's truth to you know some people are are more privileged, whatever. Some people have more opportunities. But if you can find out what those opportunities are, you can actually create them for yourself. Um, it says you in the book, it said, yeah, you can't predict the future. The best way to predict the future is to create it. Yeah. It's not about what you do that makes you successful. It's how good you become at it and how long you stick with it. Right. I'm thinking of like a scale in my head. One side is the opportunities you have. The other side is your dedication you can't be tilted completely in one way. You have all the opportunity, and if you're not dedicated, you won't make it. Yeah. If you're completely dedicated and you don't make any opportunities for yourself in the midst of that, by well, actually, no. That so the interesting thing is you can be completely dedicated and create opportunities by being dedicated. So maybe definitely. See, I guess you could argue though that if you have the dedication in the wrong way, you won't get there. I mean, what do well, you think? It, no, it did say no. It did say that you should do any, even if it's the wrong thing. If you do it long enough, you'll get good at it and probably be successful. <laughs> so, it's better to do so something. So it's not just a scale. It's kind of like an arrow. You got to start at dedication, which will create opportunity no matter what. Yes, yes. Even if you started the wrong thing, you see people are so worried about what they're going to do. They're always like, I don't know what I want to do yet. I don't. That is a terrible place to be in. You should, I mean, you should just pick something. Yeah, and then do, do something. It. And then you'll, then as you get better at it, you'll probably find a, a different way to go. You'll find, oh, this is be a better thing. And then you can start on that way and you'll keep improving. And then that, then you'll be successful. It doesn't have to be the right thing to start with. You just have to do it long enough. So it's kind of like a one-way street because you got to start with your dedication and then your opportunities will come. It's not like you can go the other direction. Yeah, exactly. We wait for the opportunities and then we think we'll be dedicated once we get opportunities. Right. But no. And we never will get there if we're not dedicated. <laughs> exactly. We oh. have to start de- with dedication and then the opportunities will come, you know? If you're wow. uh, good, if it's faithful in that the little is so things, true. you'll be faithful in the big things. Yeah. That is cool. Well, this was awesome, man. That was a really good book. Definitely. If you want to hear more books like this, we'd love it if we earned your subscription. So if we did, please tap that subscribe button on your podcast app. And we have a survey at motivationminute.com slash survey where we really want to hear your feedback on the books you want to hear because that's what this podcast is about. So send your feedback in there. Keep the reviews coming. We love reading those. And if you do submit a survey on our website, we'll probably feature that book on the podcast. So if you have a book you'd like to hear us talk about, just give it to us in the survey and we'll talk about it. Yep. So that'll be fun. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.